Hello everybody and welcome to this video which is kindly sponsored by Squarespace. Today we're going to change the Our Services page of the Paladins website. So potted plants not really suitable for medieval reenactment group unfortunately so I'm going to change that to a picture of our encampment. Now immediately you can see the problem this black text doesn't look particularly good so I can try and change that color wise. Uh, Grey, white doesn't really look particularly brilliant either so perhaps I need to highlight it and put a nice circle around it put that to red well you can roughly see that something's supposed to be there but again it doesn't look particularly great so go back to the background section and oh look there's an opacity slider now if I change the opacity to about 50 percent that means the black text if I switch that back looks a bit more visible so that's quite good and then I can go and add headers to what we offer now of course I'm going to expand that text a little bit later offline uh, but you don't want to watch me clicking and typing away describing everything that the Paladins of Chivalry do at a medieval reenactment event, so I'm not going to subject you to that, but I had a little bit of try time trying to figure out exactly what I should call the try on the armor and hold on to all the swords section, but nonetheless it is pretty easy to make a complete change quite quickly as you can see. So if after all these little mini tutorials I've been doing you think you could build a website for maybe ideally naval history purposes but you never know you might want to do it for some other reason then head over to squarespace.com forward slash drakinafel you can get a free trial and once you're ready that little link will give you 10 percent off your first website or domain so thanks once again to squarespace for sponsoring the video and on with the main show well a number of you have suggested it so here it is i have put together a brief faq for questions that do keep showing up quite a lot on the channel so hopefully if you have one of the questions, obviously check the description or the chapter links for what each one is. This will provide you with the answers. Of course, if your question isn't on this list, then feel free to ask it in the comments of whatever video you choose. Uh, but I may periodically bring out these FAQs as various commonly asked questions stack up. Nonetheless, let's get on. Question one. What are those horizontal lines that you see on World War I era ships? Occasionally also diagonal. These are torpedo net booms, seen here being modelled rather wonderfully by a German battle cruiser, and you can see them all there, in this case, laid out diagonally along the hull. Now, these are to support the torpedo nets, and this is a particularly good photo because a lot of the time you do see these booms as lines on the hull of a photo of a ship that's taken from some distance away, but in this case you can also see all the netting furled up above the booms. So this is basically in its travel position, and then when the ship was at anchor the booms could be swung out and the nets could be lowered. Initially when these devices were first invented it was thought that the ships could travel around with them deployed which would allow them to catch incoming torpedoes but it turned out that the drag caused by the torpedo netting actually made the ship significantly slower and less agile which in turn made it more vulnerable to being shot at by torpedoes apart from anything else and then even when the ships were at anchor it turned out that the weight of the netting that could be carried on a ship practically was actually now too thin to withstand the impact of torpedoes as that technology developed. Because these are steel nets, so you can think of them in a way as chain mail, as you would commonly call it, for ships, except that then if you imagine the torpedo as an arrow, the torpedo eventually got up to a speed and weight which could penetrate that, at which point obviously it would then just go in and hit the side of the ship. Their presence also caused issues in battle because it turned out the booms and the nets made excellent shrapnel and then when they were all mangled made it much more difficult to get to damaged portions of the ship if you wanted to patch it up. So during the latter stages of World War I and the early interwar period the torpedo nets and their booms were removed from ships and that's why when you look at World War II you don't see these anymore. The general principle of torpedo netting, however, was sound, and you would see torpedo netting continue in World War II, but in much bigger, much heavier nets, which were deployed statically to defend ships in harbour. Question 2. Why didn't anybody try and make a giant heat or hesh round to use against battleship armour? Simply put, scale. By the time you're looking at pre-dreadnoughts or dreadnought battleships or later, 
A capital warship weighs tens of thousands of tons, is hundreds of feet in length, and often its own main gun turrets are individually larger than any tank that has ever been built. The reason that Heat or High Explosive Anti-Tank and Hesh, High Explosive Squash Head Rounds, are so effective against land-based tanks is that all the important stuff you want to destroy in a tank is right inside the armour people, fire control systems, ammunition, fuel, etc, etc. So if you can either break your way through the armour, as a heat round does, or cause massive spalling internally, as a hesh round does, then whatever's left, the spall, the copper jet, or whatever other method you're using to get through, will go bouncing around inside the tank and destroy what it is it needs to destroy in order to cripple or destroy said tank. Battleships don't work that way. Yes, battleships have massive slab-sided bits of armour all over the place. However, if you look at what lies behind that armour, eventually there is machinery space and magazines and, in the case of the turrets, the guns, etc. But the spacing involved is in the orders of metres or tens of metres from your potential impact point. If you fire a gigantic Hesh warhead at a battleship, yes, you'll probably induce a huge amount of spalling on the interior of that battleship's armour plate, assuming you hit it on the belt armour, for instance. But all that will happen then is that the compartments immediately inside of the belt armour will have a bunch of spalling fragments that will rattle around them. Maybe they'll even penetrate through a few bulkheads, but they're most likely to then be deflected off either the main armour deck or the splinter deck, depending on what era of battleship you're on, and they're certainly not going to get deep enough into the ship to actually reach anything of any particular importance. And similarly with a heat warhead, where it's projecting some kind of molten stream, that disperses after a few metres. So again, you'll make a right mess of the compartments directly inside of with the armour belt, and that's about it. And because spalling, fire, fragments, etc., etc., were already a known risk from being hit by a conventional battleship armour piercing round, people already didn't put anything particularly vital immediately inside of the armour. So at best, you'd set fire to some relatively unimportant compartments, and the main portion of the ship that's actually vital would remain unbreached. Now there is one caveat to that, which is that the interior of a ship's main battery gun turrets are relatively enclosed spaces. There is a fair amount of vital stuff immediately inside. So in theory, if you hit a battleship's main gun turret with a large enough hesh or heat round, then yes, you could cause some pretty serious problems for the battleship. However, that would be the only place that's armoured that such rounds are likely to cause any major issues. And those areas, the turrets, are relatively small targets on a battleship, bearing in mind that in most engagements, your average salvo is probably going to miss. And when you do get a salvo that hits, you may only score one or two hits. So statistically speaking, switching all of your rounds over to heat or hesh on the very, 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 very slight chance you might do a little bit extra damage to a turret if you are incredibly lucky enough to hit one, is a very, very poor calculation. Plus, of course, if you do hit a turret with a conventional battleship armor piercing round, you'll probably still do a huge amount of damage to whoever's inside, plus that shell is useful against all the other armored portions of the ship, which, as we just covered, a heat or hesh round would not be. Question number three. What is calibre when talking about warships? A warship's gun's calibre is essentially the internal diameter of the ship's gun barrel, or the total width of the shell that goes into the ship's gun barrel, because Sabo shells are not really a thing on warships, at least in the time period that the channel covers. So a six-inch gun is a gun where the internal bore diameter is six inches, or if you measured the width of the shell, the shell would be six inches wide. In the case you can see here, this gun is a 5.25 inch gun, which means that the shell, which would have sat in the cartridges that you can see around, would be 5.25 inches wide, and then slots on an interior barrel diameter of 5.25 inches. This does not mean, as one modern UK newspaper 
somehow managed to conclude that a 5-inch gun is in fact 5 inches long. There is one other use of calibre that's common within warships, which is as an expression of the gun barrel's length. So you may see reference to something like, say, a 15-inch-42 calibre gun, or in the case of the Iowa-class battleships of the United States Navy, a 16-inch-50 calibre gun. Now, what this means is that the dash or number calibre is referencing the calibre that we just discussed, and the number that's now being referenced is a multiplier. So on a 16-inch 50 calibre gun, that means the calibre of the gun is 16 inches, but the barrel length is 50 of those 16 inches put together. So if you got a really long tape measure out and measured an Iowa-class battleship's main gun, you should find that the gun is 800 inches long. Now, of course, this means that using calibre as an expression of the length of the gun is something of a moving target because a 5-inch 38 calibre gun is going to be 38 5-inch calibres long, not 38 16-inch calibres long as it was the case with the Iowa's guns, although you do find 5-inch 38s on the Iowa's as a secondary battery. What this is useful for, however, for naval historians and enthusiasts, is as an approximate shorthand to determine whether the gun is a low, medium, or high-velocity weapon. Typically, when you're looking at battleships of the 1900s to 1950s era, the average gun will be 45 calibers long. Except for exceptional circumstances, a gun that is shorter than that 40, 42 calibre, or going back into the late 19th century, 35 calibre, will have lesser performance, and a gun with a higher number, like the 50, after the Iowa's 16-inch 50 calibre weapons, will generally mean a higher performance weapon, at least in terms of muzzle velocity for equivalent weight shells. That doesn't strictly turn into absolute superior performance for longer barrel weapons or lesser performance for shorter barrel weapons, but it does give an approximate idea that if you were going to use the same amount of propellant and the same weight of shell, whether or not that particular shell would exit the muzzle at a higher or lower velocity. Question number four is, what are knots and nautical miles? A knot is a unit of speed, much like miles per hour, kilometers an hour, or if you want to go really fast, Mach numbers. A knot is the equivalent of one nautical mile per hour. And that it used to be determined by chucking a log or similarly weighted floaty object off of the back and letting a line pay out as the ship advanced. The line had a series of knots tied into it at fixed distances. And as you went along, you timed one minute and you counted how many knots had passed you. And then once the minute was up, you would go reel the line in and double check your calculation, and that would tell you how many knots you were traveling at. And a nautical mile is, of course, a unit of distance. The old definition of the nautical mile was 1 60th of 1 degree of latitude, and nowadays is defined as precisely 1,852 meters, or just over 6,000 feet, or just over 1.15 regular miles. This actually makes the nautical mile the largest unit of measurement for long distances on Earth that is used regularly. The shortest obviously being the kilometre and the regular mile now being in the middle. So when you see a ship speed quoted in knots, always try and make sure you've got a mental calculator on hand to work out what that works out to in your local favoured unit of speed measurement. So if you add roughly 15% to the ostensible 33 knot top speed of an Iowa class battleship, you arrive at about 38 miles an hour, which would mean an Iowa class battleship going at full speed would be getting a speeding ticket and three points on his license if he'd passed through the standard UK residential street. And if you add about 85% on, for those of you who live in the metric system, that's just over 61 kilometres an hour. Or if you want to further anthropomorphise the term, the Queen Elizabeth class battleships, such as HMS Warspite, were capable of moving at around the same speed as Usain Bolt, the world's fastest human, has ever managed to move, except that the Queen Elizabeth class battleships could do that for days on end. Question number five. 
Why do World War I battleships have large clocks on their masts that only go to ten? These are called range clocks or range dials, and they are a way of communicating targeting information to other ships nearby. Like a clock, it has a pair of hands, and the shorter of the hands, the one which would be the hour hand on a regular clock, when it points to a number, it means that number in thousands of yards. And the minute hand, if you like, means that number in hundreds of yards. So in the case of this clock, if the hour hand pointed to 5 and the minute hand pointed to 3, that would mean 5,300 yards to the target from the ship in question. The idea of this was that if a ship nearby couldn't quite see or couldn't quite get the range to a target that it was trying to shoot at, then it could look at the range clock of the ship ahead of it, or possibly behind it, and then it could work out its relative position to that ship, which was obviously a lot easier because it could see it and it was a lot closer, and then from that calculate a firing solution that hopefully should land its shells somewhere on the target. The disadvantage of this system, of course, is that it can only go up to 10,900 yards, but to address this, a variety of indicators, depending on the navy in question, were devised which could indicate whether you just read the clock, whether you added 10,000 or 20,000 to it. And that would then allow you to display ranges of up to 29,900 yards, which, practically speaking, was about as far as you were ever likely to shoot and have any faith in hitting anything, even in World War II. Question 6. Why did some ships have N-Echelon turrets? The N Echelon turret system, as can be seen here with the Indefatigable class battlecruisers, was also shared with the Invincibles and a number of other ships, is where you have wing mounted turrets, but ones which are somewhat offset from each other with a clear gap across the amidships portion of the vessel. Wing turrets generally in the Dreadnought era were installed because of inefficiencies in the power plants that were available to ships at the time, whether that be vertical triple expansion engines or turbines, usually to do with the size of the boiler needed. If a ship wanted to move at a particular speed, it needed a certain amount of power. The machinery spaces had to go on the centre line and spread out from there. If you wanted to go particularly fast, you obviously needed more machinery. And sooner or later, you could find yourself with a ship that was either designed to move particularly quickly or that had particularly inefficient machinery, with almost all your centerline space taken up by machinery. You couldn't put the magazines and the shell rooms of a main battery gun turret down into the machinery spaces. It would be far too hot and it would get in the way. You couldn't put turrets too far forward or too far aft because you'd A, have to run the belt armour far too far towards the end, and B, as the ship's hull narrowed, you may not be able to physically fit them in, or it could cause structural problems and a whole host of other issues. And so the only alternative, if you didn't want to have a very underarmed vessel, was to put additional turrets on either side. But if you put a turret on either side, like, say, HMS Dreadnought did, then one of those turrets would be unavailable for any broadside you made from a given pair. Dreadnought herself had ten guns in five twin turrets, but could only bring eight of them, i.e. four turrets, to bear on any broadside. The German Nassau and Helgeland classes had twelve guns, but because they had two pairs of wing-mounted turrets in a kind of hexagonal layout, it meant they were also limited to eight guns being able to brought to bear on any given broadside. The N echelon idea, which was a revival of a concept that had been found on some ironclads, in theory meant that you could have your wing-mounted turrets, so in this case four turrets with two of them wing-mounted, but at least over limited angles, you could actually fire all four on the broadside. In practice, this was very limited and usually would result in damage to the ship from the blast effects of the guns, and the limited angle also limited the ability of the ship to manoeuvre and keep a full broadside aimed, as opposed to an all-centreline setup, which afforded a significantly greater degree of manoeuvrability. And so pretty much as soon as the efficiency of the machinery plants had improved to the point that you could get the desired speed without having to occupy the vast portion of your centerline with boiler and engine spaces, everybody reverted back to an all-centerline armament. And thus the Echelon revival in the Dreadnought era only lasted for about half a decade. Question 7. What are the different generations of battleship armour? 
There's a lot of detail within each generation and a few very minor interludes, but broadly speaking, battleship armour can be divided up into four periods, and all of these periods are dictated by one simple problem. Ideally, you want to have the outer face of your armour as hard as humanly possible in order to resist incoming fire as best as possible. The problem with having all of your armour really nice and hard is that if anything hits it with significant force, it can crack it or cause spalling, and then you have large chunks of your armour heading off inside the ship, which doesn't really help, or it might just crack in half and let the shell through entirely. To try and solve this, you need a softer backing material that will help absorb some of the impact and help keep the outer harder layer together whilst it resists the shell that's trying to penetrate it. The first era, iron armour, consists of slabs of iron plate backed usually onto wood, often teak. This was succeeded by compound armour. Compound armour replicated this effect, except that now iron took the place of the wood and steel took the place of the iron. With the steel obviously being considerably stronger than the iron, this gave it an improved ability to defend the ship against incoming projectiles. Wood would, pun not intended, however, stick around as an additional anti-spalling only backing measure right through to the final generation of armouring. But after compound armour succeeded iron armour, it was no longer part of the resistive matrix of the armour the way that it had been previously, or at least not to any degree that actually matters. The compound style of armour was then succeeded by Harvey armour. Now Harvey armour is a pure steel armour, so it gets rid of the iron completely, and uses nickel steel that has been effectively case hardened, i.e. it has been made considerably harder by rapid cooling on the outer face. So again it is replicating the hard outer face, softer inner side formula, except now steel in its more regular form is the softer inner side and the harder steel that's often referred to as face hardened steel is on the outside. And then finally you have Krupp style armour, which was invented as the name suggests by the Krupp company in Germany. And this was a similar thing to Harvey Steel, except that instead of just being steel, which is iron and carbon, it introduced other trace elements, initially chromium, and by using gas instead of coal it was able to induce the hardness somewhat deeper into the armour face as compared to Harvey armour. The process in principle would then remain largely unchanged right up until the end of the battleship era, but Krupp armour itself was subject to significant improvements, partially by changing what percentage of the armour thickness was face hardened, and partially by adjusting the various trace elements that were being introduced into the steel. And as a result, generally speaking, by World War II, Krupp armour was considerably more resistive than the original Krupp armour that had been around in the late 1890s in a per inch basis. Question 8. What is this odd winged torpedo-like object that I find stored on my battleship? This is a paravane. The idea of a paravane is that it is an anti-mine device. So yes, any ship can be a minesweeper if it has paravanes and it might even survive the experience more than once. The idea of the paravane is that you would stream it, that's how you deploy it, out from the side of the ship. Often ships would have paravane skegs if they were so equipped, which would help to position the paravane. And it would essentially fly underwater with the lift generated by those little stubby wings as the ship moved forward. The chain that ran between the paravane and the ship would then be moving through the water. And when it came across a mine that was usually tethered to the sea floor or had a sea anchor, it would essentially clothesline the anchor chain of the mine or cable, snapping it, and thus the mine, which would now be positively buoyant, would pop up to the surface where it could be spotted by the ship and hopefully dispatched or avoided. Because the vast majority of mines that hit ships weren't actually mines that hit the ship dead on, i.e. the ship didn't run smack bang into the mine and then blow its bow off, what would more likely tend to happen would be a mine was nearby a ship as it passed by, 
and then the force of the ship moving through the water would cause the mine to be sucked into the side of the vessel. And thus, by having paravanes attached to chains running at the bow of the ship, you could sever the line on a mine and cause it to pop to the surface, where it would be subject to less of that suction force and could be dealt with before anything bad happened. Question 9. What was the Jeune Ecole, and could it be made to work, or could it be made to work these days with torpedo boats, missile boats, or asymmetric warfare in general at sea? The Jeune Ecole, or Young School, was a system of thought propagated in the French Navy in the latter part of the 19th century, which held that it would be possible, through the use of new and innovative weapons, at that point principally the torpedo, to stymie, destroy, hold off, or possibly even completely obsolete the enemy larger navy, which was made up primarily of battleships, aka the Royal Navy. The idea hinged on two things. One, using a bunch of small, cheap, lightweight, fast attack craft, at that point again torpedo boats later to become destroyers, to negate the larger, more expensive, more heavily armed battleships by sinking them with torpedoes, whilst simultaneously attacking enemy commerce with a series of fast cruisers. The fundamental flaw in the Jeune Ecole was that, yes, it was entirely possible to destroy an enemy by starving them of commerce and thus trade, and yes, it was entirely possible to overwhelm an enemy battle fleet with small fast attack craft carrying disproportionately effective weapons. That part was true. The part that wasn't true was against a much larger and economically stronger enemy. And the reason for this was simply that if you were in such a scenario, the technology was not particularly difficult to replicate, and indeed you may not even be the world leader in that technology, which meant that if you had, in the case of the Jeune Ecole in the late 19th century, an enemy whose fleet was composed primarily of battleships, and you didn't want to spend the money on the battleships, and you instead went for this Jeune Ecole-style fleet, well, the enemy had the money and the resources to build just as many, and most likely considerably more, torpedo boats and fast cruisers to catch and kill your fast cruisers and to match and destroy your torpedo boats, and some torpedo boat killing cruisers or torpedo gunboats, and still have a battle fleet. Because essentially, for the most part, war at sea is an economic war, and thus the side with the more resources and the larger industry to replace losses is usually going to win. Now, as I said, you can dominate your opponent by cutting off their economic trade lifeline and sending in lots of fast attack craft to deal with their navy, but if you're in a position to do that, that means you're already the larger navy and you have lots of different options to do that, which could include escorted battleships or just blockading the enemy port so they can't get out. The only time a Junicol style approach can work when you're not already the larger power anyway is if the weapon has no particular counter and can be mounted on a very small system, or at least no reliable, relatively inexpensive counter, or if your enemy is so supremely arrogant they never bother to take any countermeasure steps. Question 10. Why don't we bring back battleships and or heavy armour, or will they ever come back? Whilst, as we'll cover later, generally speaking, the channel does not cover matters of the latter part of the 20th century or the early 21st, when it comes to bringing back battleships and or heavy armour, it really depends on how you define battleship. If you want to define battleship as a vessel whose primary armament consists of nice big guns and carries a bunch of heavy armour, then right now there isn't really a viable path to return battleships to service as frontline combatants. And there are two reasons for this. One, missiles and or aircraft that are carrying missiles can reach out a lot further than a battleship's main guns can. Secondly, whilst some modern anti-shipping missiles may struggle trying to penetrate the armour of some of the most heavily armoured battleships that were ever built, the fact of the matter is that these missiles have generally been configured to fight warships of the present day, where armoured doesn't really exist. They do have bulletproof and splinterproof armour, but on the scale of battleship armour, effectively almost every modern warship is unarmoured. However, it is entirely possible 
to make a missile that will punch clean through any battleship armour. And in fact it has been possible to do that pretty much since the end of the battleship era in the late 1940s and early 1950s. Now, whilst those missiles might be somewhat larger and somewhat more expensive than the average anti-shipping missile in use today, and therefore they died out when the targets that merited this large and expensive missile were no longer in service, it would be infinitely easier, faster and cheaper, to simply build a modern version of a large, fast, armour-piercing anti-shipping missile than it would be to recommission or build from new a battleship with any sane or reasonable amount of armour. As for whether or not battleships will come back in the future, in terms of big guns, if something like a railgun can be made to work, then yes, you may very well see ships with batteries of railguns, which could look something vaguely similar to a turret, and if the railguns offer substantial combat performance increases, but need a very large platform to mount them on, then you could see something the size of a battleship with a bunch of large guns in turrets mounted to it. The armour side, however, essentially relies on the armour actually being worthwhile, which, as we just mentioned, is probably not going to be the case as long as missiles remain a viable technology. However, in the event that railguns can be made to work and can be made to work at lots of different scales, then it is possible that some kind of railgun based CIWS system might actually make it possible to shoot down any reasonable incoming anti-shipping missile, especially if anyone cracks how to put a large scale laser on a ship as well. But in neither of these technologies cases is there any indication that such systems are anywhere close to being ready for operational deployment. But if they were, then perhaps the only way to crack through a ship's defences and actually hit the ship would be with lots and lots of barrages of hypervelocity, relatively cheap rounds, aka railgun shells, at which point potentially some future armour material, which would probably end up having to be very thick, would have to be invented to try and counter the incoming railgun rounds, at which point you'd be back to the old battleship paradigm, except now with really, really fast rounds. Question 11. What is a super-firing turret? A super-firing turret is one that is elevated above the deck level upon which you might find another turret, and as a result of that elevation, usually by raising the barbette, which is the steel cylinder that the turret sits upon, and it itself is usually armoured, this enables the turret to fire directly over the turret that's either in front or behind it. The reason for this arrangement is to do with the same amidships space requirements that we talked about when we talked about the N echelon turret arrangement. If you have the turrets on the same level, then that means the turret that is behind the foremost turret has to be set far enough back that the main guns don't smack into the turret in front of them. That takes up a longer length of the ship amidships, which you might want to use for other things and might upset balance, etc, etc. Additionally, you won't be able to fire both turrets directly forward, or in a fairly significant arc forward. So if you're closing in on an enemy or pursuing an enemy, a significant portion of your main armament will be useless to you. Whereas by positioning the turret higher, you can position the two turrets closer together, as you can see here on the forward arm to the USS North Carolina, and they can fire one over the other, which means that both turrets are available for very large sweeps of action. It is possible to have three turrets with one super firing over another and then the third super firing over both, but on a lot of ships this can very quickly lead to stability issues, and so this arrangement is relatively rare. The two most common ships with this kind of arrangement being the Dido or Dido class cruisers of the Royal Navy, and the Atlanta class cruisers and their derivatives of the US Navy. The two main disadvantages to a super firing turret are that one, by raising the turret, you also have slightly complicated your stability issues because a heavy weight higher up in the ship causes proportionally more issues for stability, but you can design around that relatively easily, at least when you only have a single stage of super firing going. 
The other problem is something that the Royal Navy experienced for quite some time, which is that if you have any kind of access point that's not completely sealable in the roof of your turrets, in the Royal Navy's case this was sighting hoods, then the blast effects of the super-firing turret above, if it fires directly over the turret beneath it, can be quite severe, and this is not desirable. There are a couple of alternatives to that. One is that you have your super-firing arrangement, but you don't fire your gun at lower angles directly over the turret in front, which is somewhat limiting. Or you just seal up those spaces. This means you'll have very little visibility out of your turrets, but once your fire control systems and communication systems are advanced enough, this isn't really a problem. Question 12. In your video titles, why do you use prefixes for ship names if the ship comes from a navy that officially didn't actually use a prefix for their ships? So firstly, we establish what a prefix is. A prefix is a series of letters that comes before, hence pre, a ship's name. So in the Royal Navy, those letters are HMS, which handily stands for either his or her Majesty's ship, because it is, of course, the Royal Navy. Technically speaking, those ships belong to the Queen, or nowadays, the King. For the US Navy, the prefix is USS, United States Ship. For the Imperial German Navy, that is SMS, which actually stands for exactly the same as it does in English. It's his Majesty's ship, except that it's in German. So it's, I believe it's Seine Majestat Schiff, or something along those lines. I do apologise for all my German listeners who are probably now bleeding from their ears, but nevertheless, you get the general drift. Now, when it comes to prefixes appearing on the channel that either aren't quite in keeping with what the nations internally use, or where a nation doesn't use a prefix at all, there are three categories, and I'm going to explain them one after the other. Firstly, you have translated ship prefixes. Bearing in mind this is an English language channel, I do my best where I can to try and pronounce things where it's important the way that the native speakers of the language in question would pronounce it. Obviously, I'm not a polyglot, so I'm not going to get them all necessarily right, but when it comes to some ship prefixes, they have a distinct meaning, but that meaning is different when translated into English. Now, in the case of the German Imperial Navy of World War I, of course, you have the meaning, which is His Majesty's ship, but that would cause confusion if we translated it into English, because you would have HMS Queen Elizabeth, but also technically HMS Kaiser. That doesn't work. So in that case, obviously, we use SMS. But in other cases, you have things like, say, the Danish Navy. Now, the Danish Navy does use a prefix. It's KDM, which stands for, and apologize to Danish listeners if I get this wrong, Königliga Danska Marina, which means his or her Danish Majesty's ship. But obviously, his or her Danish Majesty's ship in English provides the useful prefix HDMS. And so, to assist the English-speaking audience, I would use HDMS. Unless, for some reason, almost the entirety of my Danish viewers revolted and demanded I use KDM, but there you go. Now, admittedly, in this particular field, I am a little bit inconsistent. Usually, when the name means his or her, insert name of country here, Majesty's ship, I generally translate it to whatever the appropriate English lettering is, whereas if it has nothing really to do with royalty, then I tend to leave it as it is. So, for example, the Argentine Navy is ARA, which stands for Armada de la República Argentina. Nothing particularly to do with royalty, and so ARA it is. That's just a quirk of me being British, I suppose. You then have nations which don't usually use prefixes, but have accepted the use of a prefix to help in identification, and this actually comes down to the root cause of why I'm using prefixes on almost everything, 
it's basically to help with quick visual identification. If you see a prefix, you're like, okay, well, this, once you find out what it means, means it is a ship from this country. And then if you see other ships with that prefix on the channel, you know that you're looking at ships that are also from that country. And occasionally, as we'll come on to in a bit, from the same time period. So, for example, French ships do not use prefixes internally. If you ask a French person or a French naval officer, you know, what is the name of your current aircraft carrier? He will just call, tell you it is the Charles de Gaulle, uh, although in more of a French accent. Um, he won't give it some kind of prefix because at the moment French ships do not have prefixes. But for ease of identification within the NATO structure, they currently bear an unofficial prefix, which is FS, which stands or rather originally for French ship. Now, some English language historians have used for historical French ships the prefix MN, which stands for Marine Nationale, which is the name of the French Navy, thus identifying the ship with the Marine Nationale and setting it apart from any other navy that might use a ship that has a French or French appearing name. And so for French ships, I at the moment use the prefix MN. And then we come to the last section, which basically deals purely with navies that, technically speaking, no longer exist because they've been succeeded by some other force. And that essentially is the Imperial Japanese Navy and the Kriegsmarine, i.e. the German Navy of World War II. Because nowadays you have the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force, which is the successor to the Imperial Japanese Navy, but is very different organizationally and of course you have nowadays the Bundesmarine which is the success to the Kriegsmarine which is the success to the Kaiserliche Marine and so on and so on. Now in both of these cases obviously those navies not being administratively around anymore are not in a position to agree any kind of agreed NATO internal prefix or international agreed unofficial prefix and so normally they would be just left out. However, the Imperial Japanese Navy was fairly proud of its ships. And so originally I used HIJMS, his Imperial Japanese Majesty ship, much as I use HIRMS, his Imperial Russian Majesty ship for the Imperial Russian Navy. However, for some bizarre reason, which I don't really understand, some people reacted exceptionally badly to the use of HIJMS, which has been used in academic literature at times. Uh, but for whatever reason, they came up with this bizarre idea that I was trying to subordinate the Japanese Navy to the Royal Navy. And so I just changed it to IJN, a.k.a. Imperial Japanese Navy, much the same as I've done with the French Navy with MN from the Marine Nationale. And then that brings us to the Kriegsmarine, the World War II era German Navy. And in this case, there are actually two established precedents for unofficial prefixes, which are variously used in a number of academic journals, books, conferences, and so on and so forth. Not universally, obviously, well, there are two comp main competing ones, and some authors just don't use it at all. But nevertheless, the two competing ones are DKM, which stands for Deutsches Kriegsmarine, or German Kriegsmarine, and KMS, which stands for Kriegsmarine Schiff, or Kriegsmarine Ship. Handley actually works very well in both German and English, albeit I'm not sure if it works grammatically in German, because I am not a German fluent speaker, but nonetheless. And when it comes to the Kriegsmarine, this is is actually of the two navies, the Imperial Japanese Navy and the Kriegsmarine, this is where I will put my foot down and say I am using a prefix because with the Imperial Japanese Navy, if I did away with IJN for whatever reason, it's relatively unlikely that anyone is going to mistake Yamato for belonging to any other navy. However, the Kriegsmarine reused a bunch of names from the Kaiserliche Marine. So they are Scharnhorsts in the Kaiserliche Marine, the Imperial German Navy, and there is Scharnhorst of the Kriegsmarine. And it goes on like that. There are a lot of reused names. Granted, not all of them are reused, but a fair number of them are. And thus, if somebody was to just go hunting around for Scharnhorst, or Gneisenau, or Königsberg, they could end up looking at 
a number of different vessels. Now, obviously, people who know their naval history would probably look at the picture on the thumbnail and go, oh, it's this one. But bearing in mind that the channel is designed to be accessible to people of all levels of education when it comes to naval and maritime history, a distinct prefix marker is quite useful and handy. And thus, of the two, DKM and KMS, I have gone with KMS for no real particular reason other than some of the first naval history books that I read that dealt with the Kriegsmarine by fairly established authors used KMS, and so that's what I'm used to. So yes, those of you in the comments, and admittedly there's only a very small number of you, but you can stop telling me I don't need to actually use KMS and that it's an unofficial prefix. I know. <laughs> That was a long one, wasn't it? Question 13. What is the era the channel covers, and why do you stop where you do? The channel covers a period up to roughly the end of the Korean War, so 1952-1953-ish, although if you want to make it a nice round number you can basically call it up to 1950. As far as the start date, well the channel will go back as far as reasonable records ma are maintained, however Broadly speaking, the bulk of what the channel covers is in the 1800 to 1950 period. And a lot of that is the 1850 to 1950 period. The reason for that is that the further back you go, the more patchy and the more open to interpretation records go. So, as I said, I'll go back Roman, Greek, Phoenician if you like, but it's considerably harder to get reliable details in that period and therefore I can make fewer videos from that time because it requires exponentially more research. Um, if you want an example of that just go and watch the video on the Battle of Actium because literally nobody including the approximately period sources actually agrees on anything as simple as how many ships were there. Mind you with the Battle of the uh, Yalu River that's not exactly purely a problem for ancient historians but there you go. Now, as for why we're stopping at 1950 or the end of the Korean War, it's fairly simple. If you go much past that period, you run into, at least as far as I'm concerned, two major problems. One, you will run into ships which have served through or served the bulk of their lives in the Cold War era or in even the post-Cold War era. And that means those ships will have seen the bulk of their service lives engaging in, or at least being party to, various modern conflicts. And with modern conflicts comes modern politics. And if there's one thing I do not want to deal with, it's modern politics. <laughs> Long-term viewers of the channel will know exactly where I stand on my general opinion of politicians as a whole, but modern politicians especially. And so I simply don't cover those topics because... You know, it will just provoke a lot of arguments which are kind of pointless to the general purpose of the channel. Secondly, is the systems that the ships use. They start to change very radically in the 1950s. You see the introduction of surface-to-air missiles, surface-to-surface -surface missiles, and an increasing plethora of electronic systems. Now, whilst my background as both an engineer and a naval historian allows me to speak with a relative degree of authority on the hows, wherefores, whys and workings of naval guns, steam engines, sails, etc., etc., steel armour, wooden hulls, all of this kind of thing, I will quite happily put my hands up and say that I do not have anything close to that level of understanding when it comes to the workings of missile systems, whether they be surface-to-air, surface-to-surface, air-to-surface, etc., 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 and all the other stuff that goes with it. And so I don't want to sit here and speak about something which I don't think I know enough about to claim to be in any way, shape, or form vaguely authoritative on. And there's another problem. And that is that the closer and closer you get to the modern era, and you'd be surprised at how far back this actually goes, a lot of details on the performance of various systems is still classified. 
And well, <laughs> given the pattern that the channel sets in terms of telling you, you know, this gun could fire out to this distance and penetrate this amount of armor, etc., etc., if you were to use that example these days, so if you were to take, I don't know, um, a Russian granite surface to surface missile, anti shipping missile, or a British Sea Viper surface to air missile, or an American harpoon, which can be launched from submarines or from ships or from the air, then you face a real catch-22, because you can just go to whatever is publicly stated in the shiny glossy brochures or on Wikipedia or whatever and say, this missile can go X distance at Y speed and track Z targets, etc, etc, etc. Except that pretty much all of that is a blatant and utter lie in the true figures are restricted or classified or top secret or whatever your nation happens to use as their method or you are not allowed to say this in public. And whether those figures are very close to the public figures or miles away from the public figures, well, we as the public are not meant to know these things. And so what do I do? If when it comes to naval gunfire I can tell you the precise range of a naval gun, then do I say, well, it publicly has this range, or do I just say it has this range and give you the publicly official figure, in which case anybody who's listening who happens to serve in that navy or happens to be in a navy that uses that weapon system is going to sit there and go, yeah, that's not right, mate. Or do I try and discover what the true figures are and tell you at which point the channel gets shut down and interesting men in black suits come knocking on the door? You see, that there is a no-win scenario there. And if you fudge it and say, well, it's approximately this or in excess of this, then everybody disagrees with you. So it's just not worth it, in my view. There are other channels who have found other ways of addressing it and other workarounds, etc., etc. And, you know, all power to them. They've found what works for them. It doesn't necessarily work for me. And it's my channel, so the cutoff date is basically around about 1950. There is, however, one exception to all of that. And that exception is if I'm interviewing somebody who has served during that period. So, you know, we've talked about the Suez Crisis, which postdates the early 1950s. We've talked to Captain Sequest about his time aboard USS Iowa. And in those circumstances, you know, maybe we might talk to someone who was involved in the Falklands War at some point. I'm perfectly happy to have that on the channel because then the person who is speaking with any authority is not me, it's the person who was there. So if people then want to disagree with what is being said about what happened in that particular event, well, they can take it up with the person who was actually there and I wish them the best luck in the world with trying to tell them that no, they were wrong and the thing that they experienced isn't actually what they experienced. But that's then not my problem. <laughs> Question 14. Will you, or are you, or when are you, going to do this ship, this event, this battle, this person, etc, etc? Within the confines and caveats I've just outlined in the previous answer, the short answer is yes, I will do that thing, or ship, or whatever. However, there is a very, very long list of ships, places, battles, events, navies, programs, admirals, etc., that I have lined up to do, uh, partly based on stuff I want to do, partly based on stuff that the people on Patreon vote for, and partly, in fact, in large part, based on what people have requested. So I will get around to it. I just can't necessarily tell you exactly when I will get around to it, outside of what's on the immediate schedule for the forthcoming year or so. However, if there is something that I haven't covered that falls within the parameters of the channel, as we've mentioned earlier, and you would like me to cover it, then feel free to just pop into a comment, could you please cover, and whatever it is you want to do, with the battle of this, the navy of that, the this particular ship or system or whatever, and I will add it to the list. And if at all possible, when I get round to its position on the list, I will do my best to cover it. There are one or two small caveats that I would introduce again here, one of which is that, obviously, as you can hopefully tell, the channel focuses primarily on tactics, strategy, technical details, and some of the larger personalities in question. Um, 
much as I don't get involved in modern politics, I'm not particularly interested either into getting into particularly deep sociological or political issues from the time periods in the past either, partly because people seem to have a fascinating ability to get very het up and argue about events that occurred well out of living memory when everybody involved or who even knew people who were involved are hundreds of years dead. And again, it's just not worth it. And also because that's not my area of expertise. As I said, I'm a engineer to naval historian. If you tried to ask me to do the sociological profile of a 18th century ship's crew, I wouldn't have the faintest clue where to start. In fact, I could probably tell you more about the interplay between the various rival pantheons of the ancient Middle East and how that reflected on ancient cultures there, which is something I have done some reading on, as opposed to working out who was more or less socially disadvantaged in the 1720s, and how that might affect their actions with regards to their officers. And the other thing is that there are some subjects which I would dearly love to cover, but which for the moment are on hold, because I am not confident enough that I have a broad enough range of sources in order to confidently state anything. So, for example, something that comes up and is asked very often is, will I, Cabral, will I, will I cover Admiral Yi Sin Shin, a heroic admiral of the Korean Navy? I would absolutely love to cover Admiral Yi and what he managed to accomplish. However... I am also very conscious of the fact that the available decent English language sources on what he did are minimal. And, to be perfectly honest, also the number of depictions of both him and his ships and what they did is also relatively minimal compared to some, which would make it very difficult to do a video, which is obviously an audio-visual interface, um, <laughs> about him, because there's a lot to talk about when it comes to Admiral Yi. So, with Admiral Yi, for example, I would want to engage the services of a Korean historian um, who could then advise and help me to make sure that anything that I wrote was fairly in keeping with the accepted body of Korean scholarship on the matter, which is obviously going to be considerably more extensive than the English scholarship on the matter. And also there's a, I believe it's now a trilogy of movies which have been released in Korean, which cover major highlights of Admiral Yi's life, and I think the only way to do his career justice would not only be obviously to collaborate with a Korean historian and be, therefore expand the available number of sources, but also to work out some kind of licensing deal with the film studio so that I can use clips from their films in the overall video, which would be really good. But until both of those things happen, Admiral Yi will have to wait. And finally, question 15, what is your schedule and how do the videos come out? Well, for the introductory low, low price of free, um, you get to enjoy three videos a week normally. The regularly scheduled videos are Saturday, the five minute guides, which, okay, none of them are actually five minutes, but eh, close enough. And those are the potted histories of either a specific ship or a class of ships. They are what started the channel and they are still, to a certain extent, the bread and butter of the channel. Um, so yeah, they come out on Saturdays. On Sundays, you get the Dry Dock. This is typically a one-hour-ish long Q&A session where I take questions from past videos, uh, usually from a past set of videos that spans a single week. At the time of release of this video, I'm doing a couple of weeks per Dry Dock just to catch up because at the end of each month, there's also a Patreon Dry Dock which sets everything back a week and so everything has slipped a little bit. So then we also have the Wednesday videos. So the Wednesday videos are longer, usually half an hour to 45 minutes, sometimes 20 minutes, sometimes an hour plus. And these are deeper dives looking at something. And they can be a ship, a navy, a battle, an admiral, a series of events, a technology type, 
basically something to do with the main focus of the channel. Occasionally, there can be series, because you know, there are some things that are interesting enough they don't fit into a single one hour or so video. And admittedly, in the past, I have done some series and then got distracted by other things, and they still lie incomplete. I will eventually try and get back and finish those off. Um, but I have, more recently, when I have accidentally started series, tried to be a lot better about making sure they are actually continued in reasonable time. So at the moment we're looking at the US Navy submarine campaign in the Pacific in World War II, um, US Navy fleet problems, and a few other bits and pieces also going on. Roughly speaking, about twice a month, you might also get a fun Friday, and those are released on Fridays, and those will tend to be usually one of two things, either much shorter videos, but it's not a five minute guide to a particular ship or class, which talking about something vaguely naval related, but I think are a little bit too short to go on the Wednesday section. Or they might be quite long, but they might be, if they are longer, they might be looking at something that's not strictly within the, the primary scope of the channel. So rather than relating a piece of history, it might be a commentary on something to do with history, or essentially an opinion piece by me on something to do with history, such as, you know, what is HMS Hood, and if it's a battle cruiser, then does that make Iowa a battle cruiser? You know, that's kind of a discussion-opinion dash piece that I put on a fun Friday, as a way of marking it and saying, look, this is what I think about this thing. This is not me necessarily being 100% definitive about this thing, as opposed to if I do a Wednesday video where I'm, say, talking about the Battle of Trafalgar, then in that case, I will basically be saying, to the best of my knowledge, this is what happened at the Battle of Trafalgar, rather than this is just what I, my opinion about Trafalgar is. Now, apart from my own schedule and the list that I've set, which is usually roughly speaking in some kind of chronological order based on when the thing was asked for, the only other thing that affects when videos come out, or rather specifically what kind of video comes out on a specific slot, is the Patreon. So yes, there is a Patreon. Um, there's a link in the video description. You can go and join it if you like, and you'll be very welcome there. But I don't in the normal course of videos, do the whole please like, favourite, subscribe, join my Patreon, blah, 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 etc. all the time, because I tend to find that annoying, and so I don't do it. Anyway, there are four tiers on the Patreon, three of which allow you to vote on things, and obviously the higher up in the tier list you go, you get to vote on all the previous stuff, as well as what you've unlocked. Um, at the first level, you get to watch the Dry Docks a day early. At the second level, you get to ask a question, and that one question will be guaranteed to be answered in a dry dock that month, hence why the Patreon dry dock and its accompanying live stream can go on a little bit, and you get to put forward ideas and then vote on those ideas for one Wednesday video a month. At the next tier up, you get to suggest and vote on what should be the ship or class of ships that gets reviewed in the first five minute guide of each month, and in the final tier, you get all of that, plus you get to vote on, and obviously put forward ideas for, a second Wednesday video per month. So two of the Wednesday videos per month and the first five minute guide of each month are basically the choices of the people on Patreon. Again, within reason and caveats of everything we've talked about earlier in this video. And of course, in terms of what I am both capable of and legally allowed to do. So if someone asks, can you simulate the destruction of the battle cruisers at the Battle of Jutland? Um, well, there are quite a few UK laws that would prevent me from owning several hundred tons of cordite, unfortunately, um, let alone setting it off. And if people vote on me doing a collaboration, well, obviously that's also down to the person at the other end. Do they want to collaborate with me? And if they do, what time have they got? When can they do that? But, you know, people are generally fairly understanding about those kind of things. And related to when and how videos come out, I do accept channel sponsors, sponsorships occasionally. 
However, I have a standing policy of, one, I will only ever take a sponsorship when it is a service that I actually use and therefore can genuinely actually recommend. And secondly, the sponsorship has to be at least in some way related to or applicable to the general audience, who are hopefully a bunch of people who are interested in naval and maritime history. And given that on any given month there'll be something like 12 to 15 videos coming out, depending on exactly how the month falls, I also tend to try and keep any kind of sponsorships to a maximum of three or four sponsored videos a month, usually less, so that you're not completely overrun with them. Nonetheless, that pretty much wraps up everything I've got to say in this FAQ, having picked the top 15 questions from a bunch of submitted ones. And if there's other questions you see very often popping up in the channel, then obviously comment with them down below. And I'll also check back on the original thread where I picked up these ones. And maybe occasionally I'll pop in on a fun Friday with a follow-up FAQ. But obviously um, this is not going to be a regular running series because otherwise we're going to end up with a second set of dry docks and I do not have the time for that. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.